God has given all of us a mission to make disciples here and everywhere for the glory of God. We want our church to be a launch pad for sending people out on the mission God has for them. Regardless of who you are, we all have a role to play. We are all involved in God's story. We pray that the story shared through Mission Control will encourage you to see how God is calling you to be used by Him. Hello, my name is Amanda Levy, and I'm the Communications Director here at First Baptist Melbourne and the host of this podcast. Today we have Cliff McRae Jr. joining us, and we're doing our first video virtual recording. It's a good time. Cliff is the lead church planter at Radiant City Church, which is a church plant we are partnering with in Boca Raton, Florida. Um, I don't want to steal all of your thunder, but they have a very big heart and passion for reaching the students of FAU, which is very close to their church. And I'm excited for this conversation today. Before we get into all of it, though, uh, I like to start with a fun space themed icebreaker question. This one's a little bit of like a niche question because Cliff and I both went to UCF and Cliff actually played for the UCF football team. So I thought since UCF does their space themed like football games um, these days starting in 2017, we could lean into that a little bit. Uh oh. So this is like a two parter. So like part one, what do you think of the Citronaut? Um, quite honestly, I didn't know much about the Citronaut at all until I was a part of UCF. So I didn't either. Yeah. So I would say I love the Citronaut <laughs> because UCF is affiliated with them. Well, that that's a good answer. That's a, that's yeah. a solid, safe answer. Yes, he's kind is. of he's kind of fun. And then our second part, let me see if I can, because we have technology, and if you're listening to this, you're going to miss this, and we'll do our best to describe these things, but if I can figure out how to share my screen, what is, of these choices, your favorite, can you see them on your screen? Okay. Yes. We have 2018, 2019, 2022, and 2023 space game football uniforms. Ooh. Which one stands out as your favorite? They're all very different. We have yeah, the blue. Definitely 2020-22. Okay, I do. Yeah. What what stands out about it? I just love the black and the sky blue. I, I was coming the space blue rather. Yeah. Like how they co- come together, you know, playing college football and in high school football. Like I love the way we were all black, you know. Mm-hmm. But I, I think that that, that uh, space blue really pops, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a solid choice. It's yes, a ma'am. solid choice. It's the best choice. Just so. <laughs> it's the best choice. <laughs> well, as much fun as it is to talk about space and space games, thought I'd talk in outer space, thought I'd talk a little bit about your space. So where do you current, where does God currently have you on mission right now in your life? <laughs> yeah. Um, so... As you know, we're in the heart of Boca Raton in the city. Um, our church building is literally right in smack in the middle of downtown Boca Raton. And so we're like literally less than a mile away from City Hall, less than a mile away um, from the police department for Boca Raton, and then about two miles away from the campus. And um, like you said at the beginning of the conversation, um, I'm spending a lot of my time, specifically this fall, on FAU's campus. I literally came in five minutes before this call, coming from football practice with the team and meeting with some of the coaches and the players. And so I'm spending a lot of time on mission on FAU campus. And actually, you know, we literally just put in our, uh, what do you call it, our, our constitution to be have a student org to actually officially public launch. Uh-huh. Our college ministry in the next couple of weeks, and so well, that's exciting. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. How did you get involved with church planting and where you are now? Oh, uh, that is a big question. It is a big question. You yeah. can take as much as you need to. Um, yeah. So that's so. I was working. Um, so never thought I'd ever be a a pastor. You know, um, went to UCF for engineering. Okay. Um, met Jesus um, in 2008 
while playing football shortly after my college roommate and teammate died, you know, um, after workouts, super sad um, situation. And I think God really used um, Eric's, his name is Eric Planchard, used his death to really draw me to himself. You know, I kind of had this perspective that, you know, the Christian faith was more about what you couldn't do than what you can do. Mm-hmm. It was a list of do's and don'ts and um, that it was morally ethic and good to do. Um, I had some matriarchs in my family that um, had shared that with me, but um, kind of thought it was something that you do when you get bored with life after you've lived the college dream and had quote unquote fun um, air quotations on purpose there. <laughs> but um, when Eric, passed away and he died um I, I had to really ask the question you know what am I here for why am I here for what's my purpose and um there had been this campus pastor this college pastor who was sharing the gospel with me and demonstrating the gospel with me with his life and I kept giving him the holy stiff arm saying no no thank you you know but when Eric passed I said you know what let me start to investigate the claims of Christianity and so sat down with him and um, began to study the Bible and began to actually hear God speak to me from his word and um, gave my life to Christ in June 2008. Okay. Was baptized June 29, 2008. Remember it like it was yesterday. But um, fast forwarding, um, when I came to meet Jesus, I changed my major. I was an engineering major. I changed my major um, and then ended up actually going to grad school for communication. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that was a huge change, right? Like, um, I love people. And I started looking at my life more so through the lens of my gifting than I was looking at a monetary income. Mm-hmm. And so from that, left UCF, went to work in the marketplace um, for PepsiCo Frito-Lay. Uh-huh. Went into corporate sales. Again, no desire to... <laughs> To, to be a pastor. You didn't want to sell Frito Lays? <laughs> oh, no desire for pastoring. Got it. Uh huh. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, um, went there, had a really great career. Amanda there got promoted like six times in eight years, was on a good fast track. Um, and, uh, I was serving at a local church, um, in Orlando. And the elders of that church said, you know, I was serving with youth and college young adults and, they said, we feel like God has a calling in your life. And I was like, yeah, that's great, man. I love solving as a missionary in the church, you know, giving my tithes, you know, being yeah. in that way. I don't know. We feel like God's calling you to full-time ministry. You might want to explore that. And um, I laughed, you know, and then I said, thanks, but no thanks. But my my wife, being the amazing woman she is, she said, we should actually pray about it. And we began to pray. Um, that was in January of 2016, I think. On um, April 2016, I'll go to this conference in um, Orlando called Exponential. It's a church planting conference. And um, I was traveling between work, and I had one um, breakout session I could go to. And in that breakout session, there were these two men from Omaha, Nebraska, of all places, that were casting compelling vision for church planting and um, having get it having meeting Jesus in college and having um, been so impacted in college through college ministry and um, seeing their church their church planting strategy that had an emphasis in reaching college students I was just very compelled and so um talked to them began having conversations with them that summer and um, was just asking them questions alongside other people um, about church planting um and uh they um from some at the series of conversations uh ended up they ended up asking me i thought i was just asking them questions about church planting and but they were asking me questions about my purity my character and they were I, interviewing you <laughs> they were interviewing me amanda <laughs> i had no idea i was just trying i thought they were just being good believers good brothers in christ yeah you know? and so they asked me to come up for a vision trip and um, my wife and I went up to Omaha, Nebraska that winter of 2017. It was um, negative 22 degrees. And you had these two Miamians from Florida. And we come back and um, we quit our jobs, set our home. Wow. Omaha, Nebraska. Yep. 
Did you have kids? Yep. So at that point in time, I think my son was less than a year and my daughter was maybe two. Wow. So that was mom and dad are like, what are you doing? You're taking my grandkids away from me. Um, Frito Lay. Is all of your family mostly in Florida then? My mom, my, me and my wife have known each other since we were in sixth grade. Okay. You know? And um, she's from Miami. I'm from Miami. Um, majority of our families are in Miami. My mom's side is from Georgia. Okay. All in the southeast. And yeah. My so they were just like, hey man, it's great to love Jesus, but you don't have to do all of that, you know. Yeah. And my job was like, how are you leaving this? What's what's wrong? Like, why are you doing this? Is it more money? And I'm like, definitely not, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, we get up and we move halfway across the country. And I mean, I just want to share that was the best decision I could ever make in my life. Wow. And, and so um, being there at that church um, um, and getting the opportunity to see um, multiplication and church planting and getting a chance to cut my teeth in ministry and preach my first sermon, all of that, um, it was very um it became very evident that like, yeah, we need to play the church. And so um, that's when I feel like when I went up there, I, I said, I think I want to, when I left there, I said, this is going to happen, you know? Yeah. And, and I think um, really when I think about like my life, I, I began to ask myself the question, like, how has God wired me? How do you fashion me? Um, like when it comes to gifting and calling, um, somebody once told me that you can always look at it through this lens of three A's. Okay. First A is ability. Can I do it? Um, affinity. Am I passionate about doing it? And then affirmation. That's the big one that people miss out on, I think. But affirmation are other spiritually mature um, people in similar arenas affirming those giftings and abilities and calling in my life and I think in that season there and through the local church, those things were affirmed. And I just said, how do I, how do I best want to steward my life? <laughs> if God has given me certain gifts, like what's the best way I can steward that? And obviously expanding the kingdom of God and going into a place that has great gospel need um, to plan a church. Is that a bad way to live? <laughs> to yeah. Live life, you know, so that's, that's how I kind of went forward. Long so I know no, that's that good. That was a good, thorough answer. What exactly was it that you were going to Nebraska for? For training. Okay. You know, um, that was one of the things that was happening when I was here. Um, was I was working full time, traveling a lot, um, in seminary, trying to start seminary at the time. Okay. Trying to be a dad, a husband, and it's just like, how do I get an onboard to figure that out? And yeah. It was really challenging. And so um, I had to take a step of faith to go up there to get some training, cut my teeth in ministry, start seminary, get almost done, mm -hmm. and then hopefully get sent out to go plant, you know. Mm -hmm. So did they have some sort of, was it a church that had like a residency program or? Great, great question. The church had a residency program, but what brought up the role for me to be able to join the church was... um uh, was them planting a new campus. Uh, and what ended up happening was, is they planted a new campus in that first year that I got hired, the church grew by like 1,200 people. Wow. Yeah, so it was, um, I mean, a remarkable experience. And I know when people talk about church growth and church planting and multiplication, there can be a lot of skepticism, like, man, really, the church... Like when we left there after being there for two years, we gave away all of our furniture because there have been so many people in my house, you know what I mean, throughout that time. And so many people had literally came to faith in Jesus in my living room that I, I mean, I'm telling you, it was, it was just a work of God that took place at that church body, City Light Church in Omaha. So, uh -huh. yeah. Yep. So what was the process coming back to Florida? What was that like and what kind of started that motion for you? Yeah, so this is another thing that I'll share about church planting. You know, um, there's, I don't want to say there's a, a prescription or a formula for it per se, but one of the things that's really helpful and healthy that I learned um, early on in ministry is the benefit of going out, not by yourself, but at least in pairs. 
Yeah. When we look at Paul's ministry in church planting, like he was always taking others with him, whether it's Silas or Barnabas or Timothy. And um, one of the things I really valued about the church planting model in my, in my first stages of ministry was they planted in pairs, you know? And so um, that was actually like a prerequisite for going out. And so what ended up happening was, um, is while I was there, because I was so new to ministry and still in seminary and still figuring things out, um, I wanted to put myself next to somebody whose giftings offset mine. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of apostolic and prophetic and a people gatherer and gregarious and outgoing um, and a lot of raw, like a lot of just excitement and zeal. And at the time, I, I really wanted to tether myself to somebody that was more priestly in their leadership capacity, more of a shepherd, maybe had been around the block more in ministry that can kind of temper some of that zeal with experience. And so I met this brother by the name of Cameron Debity. I just want to give him his his um his flowers because he's um he's been one of the most influential people to me as it pertains to pastoral ministry, just walking along side him and so Cameron he had as we began to look in the church planting he said man pastor pastor what if we you know um came down to South Florida and instead of planting what if we did some revitalization and out of that revitalization and you helping me down there maybe we can go plant afterwards and that's the approach we took you know and so I came back to South Florida to co-labor with him in ministry revitalizing revitalizing and then stepped out about a year and a half after that and planted radiant city all right how did you meet cameron deputy i met cameron um in omaha oh okay so yep. does he come to florida with you he comes to florida with me absolutely yeah did he have any ties to florida prior to coming to florida no ties to florida at all so wow. he's a, so we were complete opposites Obviously, you can see I'm a chocolate man. You know, I got a lot of melanin in my skin. And um, and uh, Cam did not, right? Cam had freckles, you know, red hair, ginger. Oh, wow. Uh, from the sticks of Tennessee. Okay. Cameron's hometown held about 700 people, you know. Okay. And Amanda, my graduating senior class was over 1,000 people in Miami. Um, yeah. And so you have city boy, country, country man, coming together with this beautiful picture. That's awesome though. Gospel to do gospel work down in South Florida. Yep. Yep. How so are y'all still partners together collaborating with Radiant City or did he stay at the church you revitalized? Yeah, so that's that's the challenging part of our story. You know, I would say Radiant City was planted with beauty from ashes, you know. Then um, you know, one of the things we talk about at Radiant City, one of our core values is authentic worship. And we just also value the story of God, you know, and uh, one of the one of the things I love, Amanda, before what I share and kind of share about Cam and I is that like Romans 8, 28 says that we know in all things God works for the good of those who love him. Right. Those who mm-hmm. to his purpose. Paraphrase. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, planting is hard. You know, um, that's one of the things that people just don't recognize. I remember when um, we were in the pandemic and. Uh, there's this, I don't know if you're a Star Wars person, but for anybody watching that loves Star Wars, there's this meme of like Baby Yoda, right? And they yeah. saw it, and they said, when I first started pastoring, and then five years later, it's this picture of old Yoda. Oh, yeah, the full grown Yoda. Yoda. <laughs> like pastoring after five years. And I say that jokingly to, to bring some comedy to it, but pastoring and planting is, is especially is just so burdensome. And so um, Cam was influential and was one of the founding pastors of Radiant City. Him and I planted the church together, but um, due to a series of events, like um, he needed to step back and step out of the pastor. And so um, I, I just want to show him so much honors and I'm probably going to share this with him when we get off the call. Like um, I wouldn't be the pastor I am today without Pastor Cam. Yeah. From how I preach to how I prepare to how I shepherd. Um, He really, in many ways, um, helped me in such a practical way. And as a friend, um, I just can't go without saying that. Um, And really, he kind of gave me the baton to keep leading forward. Because when we came down 
through that revitalizing work, you know, he was a lead pastor and I was his number two. Gotcha. When we left there to plant, you know, um, we co-pastored the church together. And um, over time, um, I, I became this, the solo lead pastor of the church. So Radiant City Church was planted January 24th of 2021. Uh-huh. And um, in January of 2023, um, um, I transitioned to be the solo pastor of the church. Gotcha. That's yeah. a hard time to play it coming right out of COVID. But that's awesome. You're still here today. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Kind of speaking to the, the you and a joke and all of that, what are some ways that we as church members and Christians and fellow Christ followers, how can we support church plants better and support um, lead plant pastors and people who are going and doing the work? Yeah, such a great question. Um, I am so thankful for our partnership with First Baptist Melbourne. Um, I'm thankful for it because I truly believe it checks all the boxes of what I'm about to say right now. Okay. And so, um, you know, this is a cliche thing that's said, but it's really not. Um, one of our core values at Radiant City, it's prayerful dependence. And that we believe apart from Jesus, we literally can do nothing. <laughs> we say that we pray as if it, everything depends on God because it does. <laughs> and so I think one of the ways that um, churches and other members can support church planters like myself and church plants like Radiant City is by praying for them and developing a prayer relationship with them. And so by all means, we're thankful for every own unknown prayer there's so many people that are praying for our church that we don't even know of and we're thankful for those prayers but to get a note or to get a call or to say hey my name is amanda and i'm praying for you pastor clip and i'm praying for you in these ways that goes a lot you know when i come into my office and i grab a letter you know especially during this month the mcguire state offering and i get a letter from a church and, it, and it's just saying hey we love what you're doing we believe in you we're for you god's at work it just reminds me that, okay, it spurs me on towards loving <laughs> your needs. When I share with our church, it helps them to have a better understanding of God's kingdom and that, yes, we're the local church, but we're part of this greater body called the Capital C Church, right? <laughs> and um, it also begins to be able to say like, man, we were praying to get in the church building. And they, you know what? First Baptist Melbourne, you guys were praying for that? It happened. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Well, yeah. Well, that's really, really good. That's number one. So by praying and praying specifically and praying in community with that church, right? Um, secondly, I would say partnering with that church in tangible ways. And so I would just say putting some spiritual and physical sweat equity um, with that church. And so First Baptist Melbourne, you guys, we had our weekender last year. You all sent a team of people to come help us accomplish that um, by serving and loving our kids, by being involved in helping us set up and tear down, by getting lunch with our church and us being able to introduce our church to the church that came to support. That matters, right? Because um, it just, one, it shows that like, hey, you know, First Thessalonians chapter two talks about how like we weren't just willing to demonstrate, to, to, to declare the gospel with our lips, paraphrase, but we demonstrated the gospel with our very lives, right? And so- mm -hmm. If and when possible, that's just so impactful. And then lastly, there is the, the financial um, um, partnership that's so helpful. Um, we say at Radiant City that, you know, church's generosity it fuels the mission of God, you know. And so um, church planting is, is challenging. And so because of church's generosity financially and through our denomination and through Sin Network, it helps us to do things that we would not be able to do without church. <laughs> So those mm -hmm. things. That's awesome. Has ministry and church planting looked like you expected it to look? <laughs> what, <do> you... <laughs> what are some of the things that have surprised you? Oh man, um, I'm trying to be as honest as possible. And, um, well, uh, the fact that God really does use unworthy unlikely uncommon people like myself and god has surprised me the people 
that have come to the church that were like, oh, they're they're LeBron James of the Christian, uh, LeBron James type of Christian, right? Yeah. Um, like, but then also like maybe the person that's supposed to be on the bench and is not as flashy or doesn't speak as well, like them, all of those people catching the vision and God using the person that you would least expect, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, that's just been so, so, um, telling, um, I think, um, for us, like we've heard that South Florida is such tough, tough, tough soil, but to see the, the baptisms and how people have got has brought people in, um, has been great. I think, um, man, we had a visitor this past Sunday, a girl that I was in college ministry with okay. at UCF walked through the doors, you know, and, um, I didn't invite her, nobody invited her, but she looked online and found our church and saw that I passed it there and, and came and visited. Like, um, there's these strange, unique ways that God is is just giving evidence that he's real and that he's with us, you know? That's awesome. Yeah. What advice would you give for someone who is trying to figure out what their calling is or what God might want them to be doing with their life? That's also a loaded question. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I, I hate to ask the question this way, but I'm gonna like ask like you're saying, um, like their calling in life. You're not just talking about ministerially, right? You're just talking about in general. Just in general, it could cool. be ministerial, but in general, yeah. Like, um, I, I think people are gonna be the most fruitful, the most effective and the most um, clear about who they are and what they're called to do in the context of a local church. That's it. And, and I say that because if God is our design architect, right? And if we're created in God's image and um, as new creation, we've been given this, this mandate to live out um, as kingdom ambassadors and as new creation um, in Christ, um, that's best felt like in the context of the local church as a believer in my mm-hmm. personal opinion. And I say that for a few reasons because, you know, pastors, shepherds are called to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And yes, there's the work of the ministry inside the local church, but there's the ministry outside of the four walls of the building that people are called to live out wherever they live, learn, work and play. And um, I think pastors have a unique role to affirm those gifts, right? Right. And I think our gifts, Amanda, are most often identified in community and you need to be able to yeah. believers, right? For sure. And so yeah. that would be my advice for that. Like if I could just give one thing, the, lo- the, the just the importance and the doctrine of the local church, I feel like that's been minimized. And there's so many people like I did, like emphasizing gifts and roles and, and responsibilities outside of the local church and need to go back to the church when it comes yeah. to this. Yeah. How has it been being back in Florida, being you were away in Nebraska? Was that the furthest you had lived from your family your yeah. whole life, basically? Yeah. And then yeah. you come back. How has God blessed the season you're in now and what excites you for okay. the future? Yeah. So believe it or not, my wife and I and our kids, we absolutely love Omaha, Nebraska. Wow. Words I never thought I would ever say. Right. Um, but we loved it, you know, um, as a missionary, you know, you stereotype places before you go there until you go and yeah. say, um, dislike the cold winters. That's for sure. I don't like that. Okay. <laughs> um, but, um, really, really enjoyed our time there, but being there for two years and coming back two things I'm appreciating. Number one, the beach, okay? Um, the closest beach from Omaha is 17 and a half hours away. And so um, I think I really learned to appreciate being in South Florida by the water um, in close proximity to the beach. But there's a pool or, or, or yeah. the beach, it's just been great. Um, and just seeing God's creation and, his, and admiring that and being close to that, it's just, it's a great privilege and an honor to be able to be around so much beauty here in Boca. Um, I think secondarily, I think, um, as I was serving ministerially in the Midwest and as I thought about coming back to South Florida, 
Um, God really burdened my heart for the loss. You know, um, we pray every day at 10.02 a.m. in light of Luke chapter 10, verse 2. The harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. Mm -hmm. and it's just been a, such a privilege to be able to see um, men, women, and children come to faith in Jesus and know Jesus. You know, um, I was just ministering last night to a young woman um, and her and her children and that young woman in our church. I went to middle school with her and high school with her. And um, we came back here to Radiant City, planted the church. And through our church, um, she got to meet Jesus, come to faith in Jesus. She now serves on our worship team. Her son's going to be in student ministry tonight. Like, man, like, that's what matters, you know. Yeah. Yesterday, Amanda, um, there's a young lady we've been ministering to for about, I don't know, nine months. She's a firefighter, um, single mom. She came into my office yesterday, um, began to talk, went to First Peter, began talking to her, shared the gospel with her, got to walk out right here out of my office door in our sanctuary, got, got to get on her knees, and, and she prayed to receive Jesus as her Lord and Savior, you know, just yesterday, you know. Yeah. And so, like, like those are the things that just um, uh, excite me. Those are the things why we came back to plant Radio yeah. City. Yeah. What excites you? Like, the same thing. Are yeah. there any changes? You just recently moved to a new building, right? Or was this, how recent was this? <laughs> May 26th was our first Sunday. So oh, so pretty recent. How yeah. has that transition been? Um, it's been very, very good. <laughs> good and um, uh, you know, whenever you're planting, particularly in South Florida, real estate, getting in a building, a, a permanent home, whether if it's yours or you're renting, it's just extremely challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, extremely challenging. And so um, there's this sense for our church in particular because we are multi-generational and multi-ethnic. You know, we say we're a Titus II church and like an Ephesians 2 church. And um, a lot of our, our se senior saints, or better yet, our seasoned saints, um, they're like, Pastor Cliff, we know the church is not a building, but um, when are we getting a building? <laughs> And so um, I think it's brought the morale up in a major way. Um, I think there was a lot of unknowns, like in both of our gathering spots at the high school we met at originally, Olympic Heights Community High, and then at the theater we met afterwards, slash a comedy club, which is a whole nother story. <laughs> um, both of those gathering spaces were month to month situations. Oh, so there was a lot of transition and yes. change month to month. So we were in Olympic Heights for a year and a half. And then in um, the other uh, theater for like 16 months. And that kind of brought about like, are we going to be here forever? I don't want to be here forever. Like what's next? But to be able to sign a four and a half year lease where we're at right now, it gives us as a permanence and like stability and future for us. Yeah. And to put us in the heart of the city and so near to the campus, at such a time as this, we feel like it's, it's a ripe time for our church where we're at right now. Yeah. How many people, I, I feel like this is a question church planters must get asked a lot, and I'm going to ask it. How many people can your current room support, and what excites you for that potential? Yeah, so we have a lot of room to grow, by God's grace. So the, the sanctuary, um, it sits about 350 to 400 people. Uh -huh. And we're a church of about 120 right now. Okay. And so um, we're excited about that because it's like, hey, what does it look like for us to fill this uh -huh. all the time? And we have space and room to grow. Um, the, the the facility is about 20,000 square feet, um, and it sits on a coast of four acres. And wow. so um, to be able to office here regularly, um, to utilize the buildings, and really to be in, in most many ways, the primary occupant is a joy. That's awesome. Yes. I'm excited to see how all of that is used. Yes, we're not a building. A building is just a tool, but a building can be a really nice tool to use. Yes. Especially yes. being so close to FAU. It will be exciting to see. Absolutely. Absolutely. But as we wrap up here, um, what <laughs> advice or encouragement would you leave for someone who is seeking to answer the call to make disciples here and um, everywhere for the glory of God? <laughs> That is a mouthful, but it's a mission statement. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
I, I love that question because really that question is for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. It's um, we're we're literally right now getting ready to close out our sermon series in the Gospel of Matthew. Oh, what? So this Sunday, um, we're calling it Vision Sunday, and um, the text I'll be preaching from is the Great Commission, Matthew twenty-eight sixteen through twenty. Uh -huh. So, um, my advice um, to that person is to to remember three things. Um, like if you are a Christian, you are a missionary. Mm -hmm. you know, um, Charles Spurgeon has this quote. He says, "Every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter." And so, I think it's important, like when we think about our identity, like what we do always flows out of who we are. And so many believers identify with the fact that they're a child of God, right? Or that they're a son or a daughter of the King, or that they're an ambassador, um, or that they're um, fearfully and wonderfully made. But when I asked our church early on, like, how many of you all, if somebody asked you, who are you in Jesus, how many of you would raise your hand and say, I'm a missionary? Um, not many people raised their hand. And I think that's something that just, it starts there, that believing that, if God, Matthew 4, 19, when Jesus says, follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men, the great confidence I said is Jesus says, follow me. Listen. And he says, I'll make you. Yeah. And there's this promise that Jesus has a plan to use every single person that bears his name and marks his image, right? He's everybody, anybody, every person in our church, he will use you toward that end. Secondly, my encouragement to you is, is to connect to a church that has a vision and mission that's clearly around multiplying disciples in churches. Because um, when you get that call by yourself, that's kind of scary. But when you come alongside a family of believers that's going, working toward that end, mm -hmm. super, super helpful and important. And then number three, I would say, ask your pastor, and say, Pastor, how do I become a faithful disciple maker? And trust him to help lead you like Jesus is going to lead you to make those disciples. That, that's my encouragement. The last thing I would say with that is, is trust the Spirit. Trust to and learn how to hear from the Spirit of God. And um, I think you'll be in great shape. Well, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for making time for coming on to this. Was that there anything else you felt led to share about anything? Uh, just that I have a huge man crush on on Pastor Aaron, the <laughs> pastor at Shores Baptist Melbourne. How did you meet Aaron? I'm curious. So I met Aunt Aaron. So um, Pastor Muchi Ukebu, uh -huh. Miami, who I think also is in partnership with mm -hmm. her. We were we're really good friends, and um, but believe it or not, that's not how I met Aaron. Okay. I sit on the board of FCA. And one uh, of your uh, 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 Dan Carter. Yes. And so I met Dan Carter on the board at FCA. And Dan's like, man, I, I got to connect to you. Um, the Shreds Baptist Melbourne, they got to hear. And so Dan Carter introduced me to Aaron Still, That's right. Ah, I've, I've been joking for a long time that every Mission Control podcast episode in one way or another has some tie to FCA. Really? This, yeah, well, yeah. Well, especially because Dan Carter is with FCA. Yeah. And then we just, they share some offices across the street from our church that our church owns that building. Yeah. So yeah. just the ties of FCA are so strong. It's a great ministry. It's very cool. Absolutely. Was FCA the ministry you were involved with at UCF? No, believe it or not. I, I, don't know. I honestly didn't get tied in with FCA until I started planting Radio City. What? Interesting. I just assumed that it was. Yeah, no, it was not. Yep, yeah, it was a um, local church on the awesome. campus that I got to connect with. I had, I had, I was familiar with FCA like in high school. They come every once in a while, but it wasn't until um I got invited to join the board to try to actually. <laughs> so were you just invited to join the board because you were a college athlete? So what ended up happening was again God at work. Um, there was a young man who FCA's headquarters is in the Midwest. Okay. So there's a young man that um, left from the Midwest, from their headquarters, to serve in South Florida as a director, like a metro director. Okay. 
And um, he was reaching out to pastors locally in the area. He saw our website and saw like the missional language, mo the, the multiplying disciples language. And we got coffee. And from that coffee meeting and us talking, he's like, man, I'm setting up a board and I would really like to have somebody like yourself on the board. And I come to the first meeting and there's a group of men I never met in my life. And Dan Carter was one of them. Okay. Yeah. Yep. That, I think it's, it's always so encouraging and cool to see how God is connecting dots and he doesn't always use the dots that feel like the most logical dots to use. Because me sitting here, I'm like, well, yeah, you're a like a college football player, of course. And you're a lead church plant pastor. But it's like that wasn't even the dot that God used. God just liked or this guy just liked the missional language and used that dot. And then it still connects so beautifully. And, and, and then, man, then listen to this. Um, what was crazy about that is, is that so that whole year I'm working on the board, I'm trying to help that that individual find a person to work and reach the college campus. Uh -huh. He gets promoted after a year. Uh -huh. And as he's getting ready to leave, he says, hey, F um, the head coach, that we found anybody, you need somebody to go speak to the football team. Would you go speak to the football team? I'm like, sure. So I go, that was August of last year, a week and a half before F FAU's football season started. Uh -huh. So I go in, I'm in front of the football team, about a hundred and some players, and I share my testimony, share the gospel. And at the end of that, it went really well. It was on a Sunday, by the way. At the end of that, the director, chief of staff, and the head coach says, hey, will you be our chaplain? You know? I was like, yeah, sure, man. I'll come like every month or two and talk to the team. They're like, no, 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 no. I don't think you understand this. We want you to travel with us every football game. We want you to be on the sideline with the team. We want you to speak into our players' lives, to love on them, and we want you to do that year round. And that was our doorway. That was the beginning of yeah. God opening up the door on FAU's campus. Yeah. Wow. Yes. So that was um, and from that they've gotten to the building, and so it's like we've been praying about wanting to get on campus for the longest time, but God just opened up that door in less than a year. Yeah. Awesome. So are you still serving as the chaplain now, then? Yeah, and I mean, so much favor. Oh my gosh, so much favor. Um, like, I feel like one of the coaches on the staff, like if you go to the FAU website, they got me on there on the, on the, on the coaches team page. And um, every, every Friday before their games, I get to go before the team and give a message and preach Jesus Christ. Um, and um, right now, um, we're hopefully we're going to have probably – after this weekend, close to 10 players, members of our church. Wow. Yeah. Man, God. you you are an incredibly busy season right now then. Because if you're giving that message Friday, football game Saturday, preaching Sunday. Yes. Yes, yes, and yes. But, but God is sustaining you, so that's good. Yes, God is sustaining us, and, it, and it's a joy. And my wife and I are on the same page. We have a great communication and practice. My kids are still... Um, they're at the age right now where they are um, uh, playing sports now. So pretty much Monday through Friday, I'm leaving here in the office and going to helping them do that. And we're being yeah. more acting with that. But it's part of what we want to do. Like, you know, we want to be a family on mission. And so yeah. my son goes to boxing classes today. I'm I'm looking at who can I share Jesus with? Who can I talk to? Who can I witness to? That's and awesome. He knows that. We pray for our, we're going to be praying for his, his boxing coach today when we drive in. And so how can we take the gospel with us wherever we live, learn, work, and play? And how can we really be that diverse family on mission to reach Boca and beyond? Yeah. So how old are your kids now? Yeah, so my wife and I, Crystal, we've been married for 11 years. Uh -huh. um, last March. We have three kids. Um, Naomi is nine in fourth grade. Judah is seven. And um, Isaiah is 10 months. Okay. Yeah. So your youngest is about this. My youngest is four months older than yours then. So okay. I understand the season. You're, you're older or just a little older than mine? Yes, ma'am. Yes, woman. My, um, my, my boy, Isaiah, just slept for the night through the night in his own room. First time last night. So. Oh, man. Big yeah, time. Crazy. We're crazy involved. That's crazy. a great time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for joining us, Cliss. I awesome. pray that you have a great night tonight at boxing and in the days to come. Thank you so much. Enjoy.
Thanks for listening to this episode of Mission Control. If you're interested in learning more about Launch 10X and the different ways to get involved in what God is doing here at First Baptist Melbourne, a great place to start would be visiting our website, launchme.church. 